And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre. I like it when the Lord shows up, don't you? And I not only like it when the Lord shows up, but I like it when I see him. Isn't that, a, isn't, that a, isn't that a tragedy to go to a place where the Lord shows up and you didn't even see him? And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of memory, and he said in the tent door in the heat of the day. And the Bible said that he lift up his eyes, and he looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and he bowed himself toward the ground. And Abraham said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Little, little water, I pray you be fetched and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. And I'll fetch a morsel of bread and comfort you your hearts and that ye shall pass on. For therefore are ye come to your servant and the Bible said, and they said, so do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the heart. Seems to me when I read the, these verses about Abraham, it seems to me like that Abraham's always in a hurry. You ever met somebody like that? They're always in a hurry. Amen. The older I get, the more that I get in the ooze zone. I just ooze. <laughs> you want to mess me up, you start rushing me. Amen. And Abraham was always in a hurry. And not only was Abraham in a hurry, but he wanted everybody around him to be in a hurry. He says to his wife, he said, make ready quickly three measures of fine meal. I'd love to have heard what Sarah said to Abraham, wouldn't you? I'm imagining that maybe it might have been something like this, Lord Abraham, if you think that you can fix it any quicker than I... As if there was a lot that Sarah could do to hurry up stuff. Anyway, enough about that, amen. And the Bible said that Abraham, here he ran into the herd and fetched the calf tender and good and gave it unto a young man and he even hasted to dress it. And the Bible said this, that Abraham took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed. Now what we've done in the south is that we've dropped the ant and we just called it buttermilk. To me, there's nothing like a good cold glass of buttermilk. Can I have a wit and cornbread? And while I'm at it, and pinto beans, and fried taters, and a no black iron skillet with a grease about a knuckle deep. Amen. <laughs> nothing, nothing like it. That's, now that's country eating. Pastor took us over to Cracker Barrel last night, and that's my, one of my favorite places to eat on the road. But I'll be honest with you, if all the country cooking you ever eat is at Cracker Barrel, you've been greatly, greatly uh, left out in, in the better things of life. No, I don't even know where that come from, amen. My mind's on eating now. And the Bible said that they said unto him, where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life. And lo, Sarah, thy wife, shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. And now Abraham and Sarah was old and well stricken in age. And it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure? My Lord being old also, Sarah in her heart said, There might have been a time, but not now. I'm not only old, but I'm really old. 
I would have laughed too, wouldn't you? Now, I know on our spiritual days we wouldn't. Come on, right. on our spiritual days, we'd have said, Hallelujah, I believe God forever. But on our not so spiritual days, Amen. you ever had, have anybody ever had a not so spiritual day? In those not so spiritual days, we'd have had a problem. We'd have laughed. <laughs> yeah, right, whatever. And the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child with him old? Is there anything too hard for the Lord? <laughs> At the time appointed, I will return unto thee. You know, let me just say this. I, I'm on Madison, and if, when I get a thought, if I don't go ahead and say it, I, I'll forget it. You'll never get too old that God can't do something for you. Amen. Bless his name. Yeah. At the time appointed, this is what God said. He said, at the time appointed, this is what I'm going to do for you. According to the time of life, and Sarah, y'all going to have a boy. Then Sarah denied saying, I laughed not. <laughs> well, I've done that. On a not so spiritual day, have you ever tried to act spiritual? <laughs> anyway, no, my, my mind's going nuts right now. Amen. <laughs> then Sarah denied, saying that I laughed not, for she was afraid, and said, and he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. I want to bring a message to you today out of verse number 14. But before I do, let me give you a general idea of what I find going on in these verses. The first thing that I find, I find a promise. And uh, uh, in fact, it doesn't seem like that big of a promise. And that promise is simply this, that there's a boy, there's a son coming. Well, again, that doesn't seem like that big of an issue until you look at their problem. And their problem is this, is that they're the past age for barren children. Abraham's 100, Sarah's 90. In fact, this was such an enormous action to take place. Both Abraham and Sarah laughed at this promise of God. I see, I see a promise, I see a problem. They're, the past, they're past age for barren children. But number three, I see power. There is nothing being promised but what the power of God can accomplish in their life. And I promise you today, I don't know any of you. I don't know what you're going through. Some of y'all are walking through some deep water. Come on. And you're trying to hang on to a promise. Mm -hmm. And it seems like the deeper the water gets, it just seems like that the less that this promise is going to come to pass. But can I tell you, that, my friend, there's never been a thing promised to you from God but what His power cannot accomplish Amen. in your heart and in your life. People, people ask me where I go. They say, Brother David, what are you seeing as you travel? And uh, I said, I, I, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a discouraged people. And, and uh, I, I'm, seeing, I'm seeing a defeated people. And I said this, I said, I'm seeing an hour that we're living that many of God's people are plagued with challenges to believe. And uh, in fact, when the Lord comes, it's not mega church that he's going to be looking for. The Bible said, when the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on the earth. I don't know about you, but when he comes, I'd like to be found faithful. Yeah, yeah, help, 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 Lord. 
And I thought about this, Brother Ernie, I thought about with these challenges that people are facing. There's challenges in the home, and there's challenges in the workplace, and there's challenges in your church. And uh, the challenges are due to the fact that there's too much of us involved in it, uh, and there's not enough of God. We'd be a lot better off if we'd just sit back and just let God do what only God can in our hearts and lives. People today are discouraged like Elijah. They prayed fire down from heaven on Mount Carmel one moment, and the next moment you find Elijah crawled up under a juniper tree wanting to die. Heard an old black preacher preach one time on this. It's not far from Mount Carmel to the juniper tree. People are discouraged. People are despondent. They're low in spirit like those disciples by uh, in, uh, in the book of John that's hidden behind the door for fear of the Jews. And then there are those doubtful like Thomas that said this, I'll not believe unless I see and put my fingers in the print of his hands. Can I tell you this? Out of all people, you and I ought not be the ones that are discouraged and doubtful and despondent. I have, I have never been discouraged in my life, which I don't remember giving in to it. For days, it gnawed at me, and it gnawed at me, and I say, no, God's bigger than this, and it gnaws at me, and it, I said, no, God's bigger than this, and it gnaws at me, and it gnaws at me, and then finally I just give up, and I give in uh, to this awful, awful, awful enemy of discouragement. Discouragement will always come from the devil. Despondency will paralyze you for service and then doubt, dear friend, will always dishonor the Lord because when it comes to doubting, church, who in the world is it that we're doubting today? I like what one writer said, said that every step towards Christ kills a doubt and every thought, word, and deed for him carries you away from discouragement. I want to bring you a message this morning on this thought. Is there anything too hard for the Lord. Real quickly, I got to preach in a hurry. Number one, there's no promise too hard that God cannot feel. Amen. It's been estimated. I don't know if this is so or not. I heard it one time, and it's been estimated that there's over 30,000 promises in the Bible. Well, I don't know if there's really 30,000 promises or not, but I promise you this there's a lot of them. Amen. Uh, and, and I do know this, I do know that in 2 Corinthians 1, 10, the Bible said that all of the promises are yea and amen. 2 Peter 1, 4 tells us, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. What about 2 Peter 3, 9? The Lord is not slack concerning his promises. I thank God, my friend, in a world that we're living in today, that we got a book that's full of promises. Amen. Amen. I thought about this, since these promises, since these promises are so important, uh, then number one, I, I, I think that it would be good for us to be conscious of these promises. You know, people today have no idea as to what God has promised. They never open up the book. I'm a King James Bible believer. I believe it's our final authority. Amen. Are we okay? But I'll tell you this, that we're more concerned, people are more concerned about what's on the outside of the book uh, than what's on the inside of the book. And oh, what I'm trying to get you to understand is simply this, that my friend, uh, this Bible ain't never going to help you unless you open it up uh, and find out what's in it today. Jeremiah said this, he said this, he said that I'm not going to make mention of his name anymore, but then he said, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire, shut up in my bones, amen. He said the word's in my heart today, the word's in my heart. Reminds me of a young man that went to school, and uh, he told his dad, he said, now dad, you do know I'm going to need some money. And dad said, boy, I'll give you everything you'll need to get you through school. And he said, I appreciate that. 
And, uh, and so he reached in a drawer and he pulled out a box and it had a brand new Bible in it and he handed it to him. It made the boy mad. He said, Dad, I don't really need a Bible. I need some money. And that dad said, no, you need what's in this book. He said, if you'll get in this book, I promise you, you'll find what you need. And the boy got mad and grabbed the book and went to college. And sure enough, about two months into it, he'd done spent all his money and he'd done called home. And he said, Dad, I'm not kidding no more. I need, I, need, I need some money. He said, have you gotten in the book? He said, I don't need no Bible. I need some money. And then finally, in despair, he grabs the Bible and he opens it up and starts reading it. The more he reads, the more he wants to read. And he got over in there and he found a, 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 a signed check, blank check from his dad for any amount of money he'd ever need to get him through those days. And I'll be honest with you, my friend, the older that I get, the more I'm learning that my friend, my little old shallow experiences that I faced years ago is not what's getting me through well, the older that I get and the things that I face today, uh, I, I, I'm discovering, my friend, uh, where would we be today without the Word of God and the promises that God uh, has given us uh, in the Word? I'm telling you, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's been proven this morning. Thank God today uh, for these promises. Got to be conscious of these promises. And then number two, have you ever claimed them? Base your decisions and choices and actions on what God said. I remember the first church I pastored back in the mid-80s. I was 25 years old when I took it. And uh, it, was a, it, was an, it was an old established church. I inherited, when I went there, I was 20, 25 or 26 when I went there in the mid-80s. Uh, and uh, I inherited a, a deacon board that had seven deacons on it. And they were in their 70s. Enough about that. Let me move on. And uh, not only did I inherit seven deacons, but they had wives. And I inherited a church that had seven deacons, that had seven wives, that my friend that raised a generation just like them. And uh, they had an old man in that church, and they said, he's a preacher killer. I'm going somewhere. Stay with me. And uh, he hates preachers. And so I was 26 when I went in. And, uh, and uh, so I'm introducing myself during the Sunday school hour. And, and uh, he said, where are you from? And real stern, man. And I'm telling you, I was freezing up real quick. And, and I told him, I'm from down around Royston, Georgia. And he said, uh, well, go sit down. We'll listen to you in a minute. And I said, that's got to be the preacher killer. Amen. And, uh, but you know what I discovered years into that thing? That was the best friend that I ever had. He loved preaching. He loved Mays Jackson. And so I used that on him. I said, oh, Brother May said this, and that's all he cared about. He didn't care what else I did the rest, of, uh, the rest of the sermon. But what I'm trying my best to tell you, I was 26 years old and scared absolutely to death, and I'd made up my mind that I wasn't going to take that church unless God gave me a verse of Scripture. And uh, so I went before the pulpit committee, and they said, what kind of vote you want? And I said, 100%. I just got that from somebody else. I'd heard other preachers say that, and it sounded good, and I said 100%. When I said that, they laughed at me. And they said, oh, so-and-so wouldn't get 100%. And I said, well, vote, and let's see how it goes. And I started reading my Bible, trying to get me a verse of Scripture that was going to hang in there with me through the thick and the thin. And you know, God didn't even speak to me for two weeks. Y'all looking at me like you're wondering about me. I'm telling you the truth. He didn't speak to me for two weeks. And then I'm sitting at, we'd had lunch on the day they voted. I'm sitting talking to a fellow, and we ain't even discussing this church. And out of the clear blue, he quotes over that book, that verse over in Revelation where it says, and I set before you an open door that no man can close. Amen. And the Holy Ghost said, there's your verse. And the phone rang, boom, just like that, immediately. And I go in there and my heart stops when I pick it up, 
heard Brother Down's voice on there. And he said, well, son, they voted on you. And I said, what kind of vote, preacher? And he said, oh, the best one I ever heard in the Baptist church. He said, they voted 100% on 26-year-old kid preacher. Ain't got enough sense to get out of the rain. And uh, what I'm trying my best to tell you, God gave me a birth. And I took that, I took that church uh, based on nothing more than that verse that God had given me. And, and in the thick times and in the hard times and in the ups and the downs, I was able to resort to that verse and claim it and say, God, you set before me an open door. And if I'm not supposed to be here, I wouldn't even be here today. I wouldn't even be here to, oh, how long has it been since you based your decision on what God said instead of what everybody else says? Have you ever discovered this? The more you talk to somebody about something, the more confused you get. Yes. You can talk to five people about the same thing, and they'll, all five of them will tell you something different. I think we'd be a lot better off if we just go to the book and find out what God said about it and base our decision on that. I think we'd be a lot better off, don't you? Claim those promises. No promise too hard that God can't feel. Then let me say this, there's no prayer too hard that God can't answer. Amen. God is a prayer answering God. Amen. I know I don't have to tell you all that. Y'all been saved long enough to know that God does hear and answer prayer. You know, my favorite verse, in all, one of my favorite verses in all the Bible is Jeremiah 33, 3, where he says, call unto me and I'll answer thee. Well, that's a rarity today, get a phone call answered, isn't it? I usually get English press, press one, Spanish press two. Can I have a witness? I just, and then, and then I'm t- I'm, I, I finally got upset at her. I told Brother Ernie about this last night. I said, I asked for somebody that could speak English. And they got mad. And they said, this is, in their broken English, this is, I said, no, I want somebody that speaks American English. And then, my friend, you got to leave a message usually, and they'll get back with you that they never do. But, oh, God said this. Can you imagine how many people that are claiming that one verse? Call unto me, and I'll answer you. And I'll show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. Abraham and Sarah was well past the age of bearing children, but they prayed. God answered. Hannah prayed for a child. God answered. Eliezer, Abraham's servant, prayed that God would bless uh, Isaac with a bride and and put some stipulations with him. And God sent that servant, uh, the one just like he prayed for. Elijah prayed for a demonstration from heaven. Let fire consume the sacrifice after it had been soaked with water. And, and, and I'm telling you, God sent down fire after 63 words and showed him that there was a God in heaven. Would you let me indulge you or bore you with another personal illustration? My daughter has cerebral palsy, and uh, this is our 27th year into this. And uh, we never had insurance and never had a lot of money and, and, uh, and everything we got handicapped was hand-me-down. And, uh, you know, my philosophy was, you know, wore-out handicap equipment is better than no equipment. Well, true, but sometimes it's not, it's more of a burden. And I remember one time somebody gave us a, a van, had 600,000 miles on it, and it had a lift. And, uh, well, we had an Astro van. And we, this kind of lift was that old heavy lift that uh, folded up. And, you know, it led out. And it was really, and, and it wasn't designed for an Astro van. Chevrolet Astro. And we'd go down the road like this because of the weight of that lift. And when I went into evangelism, uh, I had a little Ford Escape that I had traded a Suburban for, which was a mistake. Anyway, long story short, and, uh, and so I'm up in Charlotte, Boy, Michigan at a revival meeting, 
And my wife calls me. It's in the middle of June. And she calls me. She said, David, I could hear in her voice that things weren't good at the house. And uh, she said, David, I don't know what in the world we're going to do. She said, we went to church tonight. Now, this can't just happen. There's got to be something behind this. On their way to church in that Astro van, the motors in the electric windows that raised the windows up and down, they went out. They couldn't get the windows up and down. And then the air conditioning compressor went out on it. And uh, then by the time they got to the church, that lift done gave up the ghost, and it wasn't let out. So my wife got, uh, she drove the van. My mother was still living with us then, and Rebecca in that old van. And so she crawls back in there, and they have to, they have to, whatever you would call that, you know, pull her and put her in this seat, take her out of this seat, and put her, pull and pull and push and push. And so anyway, long story short, she said we absolutely thought we was going to smother to death in the heat getting back to the house. So I, I did the only thing that I knowed I could do. I got down on my knees, and I said, God, it ain't right for me to have this good car and then be stuck with that bunt pile of junk. And I said, if you want me to do what I'm doing, I said, I'm going to need you to provide something to help get Rebecca in and out to and fro. Well, we started looking at handicapped vans, but a used one was like $35,000, $40,000. I'm telling you, that's one with forty five, fifty thousand 50,000 miles on it. So anyway, I got to condense this. I went by a car lot and I looked over in the distance and there was a town and country van. I said, if we could just get us a van that, on a car chassis that opened on both sides, that would be a lot better off and we could just, and, uh, but I looked at that and I think it was like $11,000 and to me that was like 60000 Can I have a witness? And, uh, and I said, there ain't no way that we could have, afford that. And uh, so I just forgot about it and drove off. And then two days later, Donna calls me up on the phone and said, David, I think we f I found us a van. And I said, really? And she said, yes, down there in Alpharetta, Georgia. And at this car lot, said, it's blue. It's a t is there a town? And I said, you've got to be kidding. She had looked at the same van, not even knowing. I looked at it two or three days earlier. Well, long story short, we bought the van. And the preacher Prior to that, I saw us trying to get Rebecca in and out, and they said, David, you and Donna can't go on doing that with your backs. And I said, well, we only do what we can do. You just have to deal with it. And uh, he sent out a letter, and people started sending us money. And uh, we were able to pay for that van. And, and then the handicap place called us and said, Miss Nix, I think we got you a van. Have you got your van? I said, well, I found this. She said, let me tell you what they make for that van. And uh, it's called attorney seat. And uh, it, it turns, swivels. And you mash a button and it lowers itself out and comes down to the ground and you pick Rebecca up and put her in the seat, mash the button, it picks her up, pulls her in, and you turn her into the van. The seat cost him more than the van did. Anyway, we got the seat put in the van and I never will forget, and this is where I'm going with this, I never will forget, I asked the Lord, I said, why did you wait 16 years to give us something like this? Right. You know what he told me? He said, because you never asked. <laughs> Are you listening? You never ask. Amen. Wow. I had all kind of faith to believe him for little things. How about you? But them big things, that's going to take nothing more but a shy of a miracle. I had a hard time because I just always figured if God wanted me to have it, he'll give it to me. Maybe God just wants you to clear you off a spot and step out there on nothing because there ain't nothing for you to step out there on. And my friend, grab a hold of him and believe him for something incredible, big, that only God can do that. Can I tell you, my friend, if you can pray it, if you could pray it today, I'm here to tell you that God, uh, my friend, he can give it. Amen. 
Let me say this, ain't no, ain't no promise too great that God can't give you. No prayer too, God, too great that God can't answer. Ain't no place too hard that God can't work. He can, he can make a way in the desert. I said he can make a way in the desert. He can give you streams in the desert. No place too hard God can't work. But let me close by saying this. Ain't no person too hard that God can't save. Amen. Are we okay? Yes. No person too hard. I have no problem believing in a whosoever gospel. Are we all right? Yes, sir. Let me read you some verses that I got marked down in regards to being a whosoever gospel. The Bible says in Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Joel 2, 32 says, and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Matthew 10, 32, Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I confess also. For God so loved the world, John 3, 16, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. But what about Revelation 22, 17? And the Spirit and the bride say, Come, and let him that heareth say, Come, and let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him come and take the water of life freely. Whosoever. I did a study on that whosoever and it means so whoever. I don't see a lot of people saved in my ministry if I've got a ministry. Uh, sometimes I have a hard time with that. and uh, I, 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 I meet some fellows it seems like they have hundreds of saved every time they preach. and I've not found that to be so where I travel. And uh, I see a lot of people encouraged and helped, but I don't see a lot of people say. Last spring, I was up in, uh, I'm going back in a few weeks, I was up in uh, uh, Springfort, I think the name of that, Brother Mike Long's there in Charleston, West Virginia. And uh, I walked in, and revival to that church is a big thing. It used to be for us. I mean, they, they'll have prayer meetings all during the day. And, and prayer meetings are as spiritual as that service is at night. I'm telling you, they'd get them old men together. And usually it was just the older men. The other ones were working, of course. But the retired and the older men uh, and the women, they would come. And, and uh, Brother Mike would give a small devotion. Uh, and uh, they'd have some prayer requests. And I'm telling you, God would show smack dab right in the middle of it every day. I look more forward to going to that, that, that prayer meeting I did Okay, and, uh, and so we, they pray. It's a big deal. They had a big sign, Spring Revival, you know, up in the mountains, if you'll forgive me, brother. In the mountains, they believe the only time you have revivals in the spring and the fall. <laughs> Are we okay? Yes. And uh, so uh, anyway, uh, it's a big deal. And, uh, and they brought sinners I'll tell you why we ain't getting people saved. Come on, we ain't bringing sinners. Right. Y'all ain't going to hurt me. Y'all will let me eat before y'all hurt me, won't you? Amen. <laughs> and so anyway, long story short, they bring sinners in. And I'm sitting talking, shaking hands, Brother Randy and... Uh, and his wife, Ma, uh, that's his daughter. Yeah. It don't matter. But uh, Randy, brother Randy uh, Wilson's wife, Shirley, uh, was shaking hands with me. And Miss Shirley looked at me, hugged my neck, because I've known them since the early 90s. And she hugged my neck and said, Brother Dad, that's a good message. She said, you see that man going out the door there? And I said, yes, ma'am. She said, that's my brother-in-law. She said, we've been praying for him for 40 years. Said that he's not getting no younger, he's getting older, of course. And, 
Ain't got much time. Pray God will save him this week. Well, my heart just stopped because I'm looking at my track record. I don't see a lot of people saved. And I'm thinking, they've got the wrong fella for the meeting. And oh, Brother Ernie, I preached my heart out that week and I wept. And I wept and I pleaded and I wept. And I did almost get down on my knees and beg them to come. And uh, we did have one man saved on Friday night uh, that had gotten out of prison, but uh, Burl was his name. And, he all, and, and, and four nights out of the five, he said about three pews back on the end. And I looked at Brother Long, and I said, uh, he's, I said uh, he's come three nights. And he said, oh, that's very unusual for Burl. He always come one night of a revival to get his wife off his back. But he came four nights out of the five. And I said, he stood in line last night and shook my hand. And he said, you got to be kidding me. said, he always would sneak out the back and go down the basement so he wouldn't have to stand in line so long. And the old man come up to me and he looked at me and this is all he said. He said, you're doing a good job, boy. And, and it walked out the door. And son, I'll tell you, did my heart good. Closed out the meeting on Friday night. Guess what? Burrow didn't get saved. And I went back at motel and I cried. I said I failed. I went on up from Beckley or Charleston. Went to Summersville to preach for a friend of mine. And uh, I was going home with him for lunch, and Mike Long calls me on the phone. <laughs> he said, you sitting down? I said, yeah. He said, you ain't never going to believe what happened this morning. He said, we had one of the, 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 the most wonderful services that we've ever been in our life and said that I preached on prepare to meet thy God. And he said, and I looked back, and they always had an agreement with his wife, put Burl on the end. So that way, he won't have to go around anything to get to the altar. He can just go right straight to the altar. But he looked out there that morning, and there his wife was on the end, and Burl was sitting, and he's saying, what in the world is she thinking? And he said, I about got in the flesh just thinking about where she was a sitting. He ain't never going to leap over her to get to the altar. And he said this. He said, Brother David, he said, I preach. I call for the invitation and he said, and I got down behind the pulpit to pray, and about that time I heard his wife go, ooh, Burl had leaped over her and made a beeline right down to the altar. Well, he said, when I saw what was going on, he said, I just got up, quit praying, just started shouting all over the platform, like toward the platform, all to pieces. And they said it scared the church because they didn't know what was happening. And they looked up from praying and saw all this and saw Burl in the altar. And the church just erupted in shout. Long story short, Burl got saved that morning. Amen. Forty years of praying. Can you imagine how many revival meetings in 40 years? Can you imagine how many times that that wife went to her house and laid her head on her pillow and wept in the midnight hour thinking that her husband was never going to get saved, was going to die and go to hell without God? Forty years. But he got saved. And I'm here to tell you today with all of my heart, I don't know where you're at in your life and I don't know who you know and what the burdens that you're bearing for your lost loved one. The devil would like for you to give up and I'm telling you there's times in your life that you're convinced it ain't doing no good but pray on church. Uh, keep trusting, keep praying uh, because I'm telling you uh, there's nobody uh, that's too hard that God can't save you, man. I'll tell you this. I've met a lot of it's too good. I appreciate what you said about that soul. It's exactly right. I won't tell you something until we get to the place that we start seeing people ask something in need of something. We ain't never going to get them. Does that make sense? 
I did the same thing about them spiked hairs and them boys that looks like they run into a tackle box and all that stuff, you know, God, it's, I remember one time I was at a mall, I'll tell you this, and I'm, I, really, I didn't mean to lie to you on that, I am through. I was at the mall one time with my boy, we were walking, we saw one of them, and his pants was down, and, and uh, uh, he's a mess, you can tell he's a mess. And I started getting critical of it to myself. And, uh, and the Holy Ghost said that somebody's boy and some mama's son. Are we okay? Come on, brother. And somebody's son. And uh, I got a new light on that. And I looked over at my boy and I said, Josh, I'm glad you don't want to be like that. And uh, but what I'm trying my best to get you to see is this, is that, my friend, we got to see them as something. Jesus looked at a multitude one day, and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. Come on. They're souls. They're individual souls that are in need, my friend, of somebody. If they don't get saved, if this community yeah. dies and goes yeah. to hell, let them die and go to hell for some other reason that that was not a church or, uh, that, that, or that was a church that didn't pray for them. Hey, husband, keep praying for that wife. Hey, wife, keep praying for that husband. Hey, mama, keep praying for them children. Amen. Well, let me ask you something, Faith. Is there anything too hard for the Lord? How about it? Answer it. Is there, shake my hand, is there anything too hard for the Lord to do? Nothing. Uh, can I have a timeout? Y'all permit timeout. Go ahead. Go ahead. Hallelujah. Bless his yeah. wonderful day. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we're in good hands. You say, but I can't see him, but he's there. You say, but I can't feel him. He's there. <laughs> oh, bless his name. Is there anything too hard for the Lord. How are you today? How are you today? You about ready to give up on that prayer? Now be honest with me. I know and on, on our spiritual days we're not. But we don't always have spiritual days. You about ready to give up? Won't you come? Won't you come today and find yourself a spot and say, Lord, this is bigger than me, but it's not bigger than you. And then, sinner friend, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus as your personal Savior, why don't you come? Why don't you come? I promise you this, he'll meet you. <laughs> he'll meet you. While we stand with heads bowed, our eyes closed, if somebody comes and gets us a verse of song,